This is intentionally a lightweight talk. It was actually, well, first of all, who am I? I'm Peter Dalgar. I'm a professor at Copenhagen Business School, not that it really matters here. I've been on the R core team since August 1997, and I've been the sort of guy handling the physical R releases since December 1997. So what's this talk about? Well, it's not going to be exactly what it says in the abstract because it's amazing how much stuff you can cram into a three-line abstract and then figure and then find that you don't have the time to say it all. Right, so this was the idea to give the history of R releases, the role of the R core team in development and principles and blah, 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 blah. And then I would put in some lightweight stuff telling you what's the logic about the R release names. And as it turns out, when you get to actually do it, the only thing that's really room for is the release name stuff. And that's also supposed to be the fun stuff. So we'll keep the fun stuff and throw away some of the more boring stuff. So, but some things are kept in there. So first thing, what I'm not really going to tell you what, in, what involves, uh, what is involved in being a release manager but I can at least say how I got into it. First thing was that you got into the core team by being vocal on the mailing list of the time. Then once you're in there, I was starting to look at the features that, the, the tools that we had available, and I got a little bit of religion when I learned about the CVS system, which was, briefly put, what GitHub was in 1990X. Uh, and finding that there are things like branching and may, may the possibility of making patches and so forth, which we really should use the CVS features for. And after pestering Rossi Harker a couple of times, he got with this thing in an email here. Uh, are you putting your hand up as release manager? Um, and uh, after a while, I actually agreed to do that. Uh, so I've been doing the releases since first one was probably in December 1997. So this worked. Uh, the first releases were manual. You sat down at your computer in your basement using your dial-up modem into the biostats department. Then from the biostats department, you'd take an SSH connection to the Auckland machine. And following a very detailed script of che checking things out of the uh, repository and building things and wrapping up tarballs, you could make the R release available on the FTP site in Auckland. This had to happen on late evenings in Denmark because you tried to avoid other people messing with the repository at the time. So uh, about 11 p.m. in Denmark was sort of the suitable time because no one would be awake some, anywhere else. Uh, <clears throat> as it happened, not that it's really material for this presentation, but uh, one of the first incidents was, remember that this started in December 1997. By 1998, the 30, 23rd of February, just before we were doing a release, the whole Auckland Central Business District had a power failure that lasted for a week or so. So they actually had to physically move the machine that had the R sources across the street because they had better power supply over there. Anyway, over time it's developed into a quite automated release procedure. So basically making a release nowadays is a matter of uh, filling in some cron jobs and editing some of our online documentation saying which is the next release of R and what was the previous one and so forth. Uh, if you want to know more about the details, which you really should, uh, look at things on the develop developer.rproject.org to see it. Uh, and I don't really think I want to say too much about release timing except that we typically key them to the northern academic year because people use, uh, people generally install during the summer holidays. So we have a release in April, and the worst of the bugs would be out, would be fixed before uh, the next academic year starts. 
Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> I mean, we, we like to have a little bit, bit of fun when we do the releases. It's boring when it's, when it's just numbers. So, the some of the first things we did was to try to get a suitably nerdy release date of version 1.0.0 that came out in 1999. And as you know, uh, the 29th of February in 2000 is a thing that only exists by the 400 years rules of, uh, of leap years. So every fourth year is a leap year, except every 100 years, which is not a leap year, except every 400 years, which is a leap year. Okay? <laughs> so it was too tempting to, to put it on that date. Now the problem with date games like that is that you run out of steam pretty quickly uh, for version 2.0, we had uh, a little bit of residual humor to put it on 2004, 10.04, but that was about the uh, extent of it. And then we moved the releases to occur in April, and we were sort of out of ideas. So then in um, a couple of years later, many years later actually, in uh, 2011, someone had the idea of putting a little bit of fun into things by having named releases like actually several Linux releases has been having fun names and Debian Ubuntu was using things like Intrepid Ibex, uh, whatever that is. Uh, <laughs> and so someone was sort of airing that idea and we uh, had a discussion and uh, there was no real formal decision except leave it to the release manager. So it said, in the minutes, it said, should we name releases? Uh, and it, then it says, PD will think about it. Some names were discussed. And actually, the names that were discussed were generally sort of related to the Halloween idea because we had also planned the next release for uh, 31st of October. Uh, so um, when the time came, we had this one, right? So the Great Pumpkin was uh, the first of the named releases. And it wasn't actually completely obvious to others than me that this had anything to do with Peanuts cartoons, because pumpkins are eaten at Halloween anyway. Uh, but of course, we needed to continue the process. I mean, one release name is a bit silly. We need to have a continuum of release names. So um, from the beginning, I wasn't really sure whether I should just use random cartoons or whatever. Uh, but we needed pretty soon to have the next release. And also, we needed to have a name for the development version, the one that's unreleased. And so that one got the name Unsuffered Consequences, which if you know your Peanuts literature has got something to do with Snoopy taking Linus's security blanket. Uh, and do that or you'll suffer the consequences. And he sort of cowers back and says, my life is full of unsuffered consequences. <laughs> and that's, I thought, would be suitable for a, an unreleased version. Uh, notwithstanding what Bioconductor is doing with them, but they do have to suffer the consequences from time to time. Um, and obviously, uh, it's probably dawned on people that this was, uh, had something to do with Peanuts quotes. Also, the December snowflakes is that they are trying to catch snowflakes on the tongue and someone saying, I'm not going to eat them. They are in December because they're not ripe until February. Anyway, the, so the basic idea is that peanuts would actually be quite suitable because everyone in statistics is a peanut, right? <laughs> uh, <coughs> so continuing this uh, scheme, basically what I did was every time there was a release, I was scouring through the internet. Uh, usually there were pages of these peanuts quotes and looking for something that were on topic for the release and would fit into two to four words. And it shouldn't be so direct references that it would have the Charles Schultz estates coming after me, telling me to uh, cease and desist. So, so it should be a little bit obscure. 
And actually, Lucy uh, McGowan has been digging up all the actual references to the actual uh, peanut strips, which you can find if you look carefully or you, you, if you look up her blog at this address, or maybe rather that address. Uh, if you don't know what orchidectomize is, then you haven't had a cat. Uh, but <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so they're not entirely uh, randomly chosen. There are some side themes going on in the choice of names. Uh, often, for instance, the wrap-up releases, the last one before next dot zero release, they are, have a name that's associated with comfort and safety and happiness and so forth. So 215.3 was security blanket, 303 was a warm puppy, and occasionally uh, a personal reference slipped in. The kite easing tree was actually something I saw in the wild, and one of them is, an, is actually an epitaph, as you'll see in a second. So here's the warm puppy, and here's the kite easing tree, uh, close to where we swim in the winter. Uh, and this one is from my stepdad, uh, the last version here in um, February. Um, continuing the theme, there are sort of, I have a few extra stories on various things that I may have to skip quickly across, but uh, one release was version 3.0.0, which was named the Masked Marvel. Uh, and the reason for that was that up until pretty close to the release, uh, very few people realized that version 3.0 was coming uh, because we've been discussing it for years and years and years. And then in December, Brian came with this quote, if these changes are not enough for 3.0.0, I don't doubt we'll ever have enough. So we'd have to do it. So it ended up being the masked marvel, which is, of course, Snoopy uh, dressing up as the arm wrestler in, in this one. So we've also had themes on seasonality. Easter, winter, summer, Halloween are pretty obvious. Uh, references to bugs, uh, bug in your hair. Things that broke when thrown at juices. That's the another canoe. Uh, <clears throat> usually we have the dot zero versions. We've got something that in place playfulness, so the last one was joy in playing. We've also had the slightly backhanded one of saying um, supposedly educational, which, in which the full quote is, try not to enjoy it, it's supposed to be educational, uh, which is sort of really saying the obvious. Uh, 3.2.0, that was full of ingredients, which was because we were having a major release, but I, when I looked down the list of changes, I couldn't really see anything distinguishing. So I found this one here where Linux says, uh, where Linus, I think, says, I can't eat this, it's full of ingredients. <laughs> this one here was almost a misstep because uh, some people, when they first saw the name Use Stupid Darkness, took it a bit as a bit of a microaggression, which was not at all the, uh, the, uh, the intent. It was really just the... Brexit and the presidential election in the U.S. and so forth that were making me a little bit depressed. And so I had this thing about lighting a candle in the dark instead of cursing the darkness. Fire safety, this was uh, a search advisory. Came, so this came out a little bit earlier than we had expected, but because someone was complaining that we were not using secure connections for connection to CRAN. Uh, this one, lift off. Uh, this one I could have reused this year. This was due to the World Cup soccer going on at the time. And finally, here are some that I hope we will never use. Uh, and um, thank you for your attention. Googling for peanuts, for example. 
I mean, just sort of reading a few pages of them until something clicks in your mind and say, hey, that's a good name for a read. So it, it, the, the, the criteria are that they, they should be short enough that it could, I mean, I think the longest one is in four words. Uh, and possibly also a little bit obscure so that it's not too obvious that we're doing the sneaky R version or something like that. Uh, and then maybe something that's slightly topical related to what's going on at the time. Yeah? Well, I think it was a hand and war stories. War stories, well, there are, a few ha there's, there are a few hiding in here, for instance, this one. Uh, the, uh, the search advisory, so sometimes we have to make releases before we uh, expect it. And the, uh, the story about the city business di district blackout would also be one of them. I don't think I have any, I, I have other war stories, but they take like 10 minutes to, to explain. <laughs> <laughs> like when the, when a change in the Korean translation at some point caused an error on FreeBSD within, a, within the scope of two days just before a release. Uh, things like that happen, um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't think it will. <laughs> I, I, I don't have any other ideas, uh, and it's actually a pretty rich resource to, to look through. And, uh, there are many, many things that we, 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 we haven't explored yet, like eggshell igloos and, and things like that. So I, I think we can probably keep it up for some time. 